and welcome to Spiritual Basics Podcast with April and Jen. This is a bi-monthly podcast designed to teach the searchers, seekers, and spiritually curious the basics of metaphysics and new thought. My name is Jen Merkel. And I'm April. Hey, how is it going, April? It's going good. I've had a really long, exhausting day, so you have. Hopefully you know, I was looking. I was thinking about something. You know, when we do our little chats at the beginning of each podcast, I feel like it's all about Jen all the time, and it's like <laughs> you know, I don't mind talking about myself, but I feel like y- we don't hear enough about you. Like, I don't know if there's like a, a thing like you just don't like to talk about yourself or, <laughs> but you're a good conversationalist. So oh, I don't right. know what's going on. So, so this is all in my astrological chart, actually. <laughs> of course. So, <laughs> of course. So if you've listened to the show or you know me, you know that I love astrology and I love personality <laughs> profiles. So blending those two together, is like my geeky little passion. And I have my Mercury, which is the planet of communication in Gemini. And Gemini is the twins, right? And Mercury is the ruling planet of Gemini. So that's right. Yeah. So it's like a double. It is a double like, yay for communication. A double, double plus it's in Gemini. So it's already (laughs) a double. So is that a quadruple? Like, I don't know. So you might be wondering if you got a Mercury in Gemini, why the heck aren't you talking, April? Well, here is why. So Geminis are also known as the chameleon. So when you have a Mercury in Gemini, you're known as the actor or the chameleon. Hmm. So I I heard one astrologer describe it like this. If there is a party and you walk into the room, you will assess the room and then you will become what the room is missing. Oh, the chameleon. Okay. That makes sense. So you're kind of like, blending in how you best see fit kind of but usually chameleons do that like for a (laughs) self-preservation mode is that the case I don't know probably sometimes right (laughs) Uh, so and it is also because my personality profile is introvert so I'm not an extrovert that will barge into that party and go look at me look at me but I'm going to figure out how to seamlessly blend with that party So you'll notice me there and you'll be entertained by me, but intellectually entertained instead of like, I'm dancing on tabletops. Well, that explains because, you know, me as an Aquarius, I look for that intellectual entertainment. That's what, well, no wonder we've got such a good partnership going on. Right. right. So sometimes, and I'm going to let you lead for a while. And then I'm going to join in. I need to watch the steps of your dance. And then I'm going to step in and, and do the dance, you know. Well, it's kind of funny because we were chatting about this before when we, I can't remember what it was. I had some new idea, like my Aquarius brain had some new idea for something. And I'm like, we should do this. And then we should do that. And then we should do this. And you're like, whoa, slow down. What's going on? I'm like, but come on. I'm like, I was like this river of creativity and ideas just flowing out of me. And you're like, my head is spinning. And then I'm like, hey, I'm the Aquarius. That means I like to drive. You're the Taurus, which means you like to just be along for the ride. Right. Like you're that's my right. faithful companion. We make a good uh-huh. team. And <laughs> that's right. So that's uh that was a good analogy. So I could see how your yeah. Mercury in Gemini would come into play there. I have my moon in the eighth house, which means that I like to cultivate a little mystery. Ooh. Oh. See, I made you curious. You're like, what about April? What's going on? Yes, for sure. Because I'm, cause I'm all show. mysterious over here. <laughs> <laughs> Where's your Jupiter? Do you know where that is? Because that's about mystery, right? Uh, yeah, I actually the don't know. I would unknown. have to look that up. We need to do a <gasps> Wait, show. What? I'm what lying. It? It's in the eighth house as well. Oh, I well, have Jupiter. Okay. I have Jupiter, Mars. No, yes, uh, Jupiter, Mars, and the Moon in the eighth house. Okay, that makes perfect sense then. But we <laughs> need to do a show about astrology soon. I know you love it so much. I do too. I do. But uh, I kind of, I'm kind of like a learn as I go. Like I'm blogging about it a lot, but it's for mm-hmm. me, it's like doing a lot of research and then blogging about it. But that's how I learn too. So of course, <laughs> yeah, that's an Aquarius though, right? You're researching, you're learning, you're blogging, you're sharing with others. That's classic yeah. Aquarius. Pretty much, pretty much. Oh. Awesome. Well, communication really kind of uh, ties in 
to what we're doing today. You know, it certainly does in many ways. Today, we are talking about the five love languages. And what this is basically going to be is an overview of the book by Dr. Gary Chapman. It's called The Five Love Languages, The Secret to Love That Lasts. And um, just a little disclaimer, these are not our original thoughts or concepts. We don't have any affiliate payments going on, anything here. We just wanted to provide commentary and interpretation on the ideas from Dr. Chapman. We are recommending the book and suggesting you read it. So once we give the overview and everything, we can give more information on the, at the end about how to get it. But you know, you can get everything on Amazon, of course. But why we recommend it, it's because it can help to improve really any type of relationship. It'll help you to get a better understanding of other motive, others' motivations as well as your own. And when you learn about others' love languages and apply them, you actually help them to feel loved. And what Dr. Chapman calls it is their love tank. You help to keep their love tank full. Um, and the book actually has a lot of exercises and poses a lot of questions that'll help you. This is not a course or anything. So that's another reason why we do recommend you get the book. Uh, one thing to say about the book also, it was originally designed for married couples. He's actually a marriage counselor. Um, but again, it can apply to any relationship. There are other versions of the book. I actually have, I didn't realize this until I, I dug it out again. I haven't read, I think I read it about six or seven months ago, but it's well, the one that I have is the singles version, which actually <laughs> seems kind of sad when I'm thinking about it. But anyway, there's also a children's version, a teen's version, one for the workplace. There's even one for the military. So there's a bunch of other ones, but even if you just get the generic or the regular the OG book, it does have information about all those things. And it's, you know, like, I don't feel like the singles edition gives me so much um, information necessarily that you wouldn't have gotten in the regular book or be able to mm -hmm. apply, but it's got a couple little things. Like it has at the end, it has an actual section about online dating, the benefits, pitfalls, and things to consider. I'm like, oh, I better read that because I just started <laughs> trying to do online dating, but I don't even want to talk about that. So we can just It's for a future show. <laughs> on. Maybe. We'll see. But the whole concept about the love languages also that the point that he brings up is that everything is rooted with the parents. So any lack of love people have received or not received from their parents causes us to search for it in other people. So the relationships that we have with our parents motivates us to have certain types of relationships or seek out certain things with people. So that's where this whole thing came through. Um, as far as applying the love languages in a general sense, as we go through each one, we're going to go through each, each of the five and talk about them. As we go through them, think about which ones might be your top one and your secondary one, but then also think about what might be your partner's top and secondary one. And, you know, they don't have to match. I mean, it is helpful, but regardless, it's going to help you to learn about how you want others to express love to you and also how you can better express love to your partner. So seeing all the people in my practice, and I think even Dr. Chapman says this in the book, it's actually kind of rare for you and your partner to be the same. Most mm. people usually have opposite or opposing love languages, and that can be a real source of miscommunication yeah. and frustration within relationships. And not just romantic, but a friend of mine uses this at work for his coworkers. And he's very, he works in Microsoft and it's all about team environment there. And so he's made a special point to try to show appreciation to his, each of his team members in the method of their love language. And it is very different from person to person. Yeah, that's really important to think too. Like, you know, once you read the book, because you're not going to remember all of this for every aspect of your life. I mean, you can listen to the podcast as much as you want. You know, you can listen to it again and again and again. We Please would love do. that. But I mean, what to really get the best out of it, you really should read the book. But once you have the book too, you can read through it and really learn how to apply it to all those other relationships. But like you were saying, to be a supervisor and apply it to your employees is really great. But also you can you know, apply it to your bosses and kind of be a suck mm -hmm. up, you know, for <laughs> lack of a true. better word. But we're going to you know, rename this episode Corporate Strategy 101. How to manipulate people. No, just kidding. <laughs> um, your but, kids 
understanding oh. that your kids will not be the same love language as you sometimes right. and you may have to alter your style to get right. to give it and loves. actually it would be a great thing to even teach your kids so that they also know how to manage other relationships throughout um, their lives I'm a big fan of that. That's a great idea, teaching kids about emotions and understanding that Sometimes other people- I wish I could like rewind and go back <laughs> to when my kids were little because they're all up and grown and out of the house now. But yeah, you know, but now if I bring that kind of stuff up with them or if I give them the book, they'll be like, oh, here's another crazy book mom wants us to read. <laughs> Like getting underwear for Christmas, right? <laughs> yeah. Oh, one of those books. Okay. Yeah, sure. I'll read it, mom. Whatever. <laughs> well, all right. So first one up is words of affirmation. And this is actually my number one love language. And it's also my mom's love language as oh. well. But for words of affirmation, it's words that will uplift and support and empower. So it can be anything from I love you or great job. You cooked a fantastic dinner tonight. But people who have words of affirmation as their primary love language, they do want to know that you appreciate them, that they their efforts are noticed, and they need to receive that feedback in a very verbal way. Mm -hmm. So it's super important to tell your partner with words of affirmation, I appreciate you. You're doing a great job. I love you. I see you. I recognize you. Gold star. Because when a words of affirmation person gets that kind of positive reinforcement, man, we just shine. You have made our whole day when you say, oh, that shirt looks amazing on you. That's a really great color. I mean, it, it can be anything like that, but that positive verbal reinforcement is really important. And, you know, one thing to point out too, I think it's really important to make sure it's authentic. You mm -hmm. know, I mean, it's great to be like, oh, I really want to make Mary's day. So I'm going to tell her she's got a really nice skirt on or something. And, you know, that's fine as long as you don't sound trite or like you're just sucking up. Like I was teasing about that a minute ago, <laughs> but seriously, you want to make sure it's something genuine. So I might say, you know, I really want to make Mary's day. So let me find something about Mary that I really like about her or that I can tell her that's going to make her happy and then use that as long as it's genuine, I think, because people I think can really see through that. Absolutely. And if you are disingenuous to a words of affirmation person, yeah. it, it, you know, we are know. now angry, <laughs> right? Yeah. We're now disgruntled mm -hmm. uh, that you would dare twist the words of affirmation to sully them. It's like, you yeah, know? they're using it as a weapon. How dare you sully my positive reinforcement. <laughs> but I, I read an article by someone years ago. I can't remember the guy's name, but the article was breaking down the uh, love languages in terms of neediness. And this person oh. felt words of affirmation uh, tended to have lower self-esteem. So if you feel that that is you, then please make sure that you are giving words of affirmation to yourself because that is hugely important to look in the mirror and go, you've got beautiful eyes. You are amazing. You do a great job. You're a great cook. You know, you're a good mom. And if you feel like you're not getting words of affirmation from your partner, it is important that you provide them for yourself. Yeah, I think that's a really good point because uh, if you're not getting them elsewhere, especially, you need to make sure you're hearing them. Because there is a, a section of your brain that subconscious doesn't know the difference. That's correct. In hypnotherapy, we know all about that because that's what yes. we're all about, really, actually. Yes, you do. So, yeah. Cool. Well, the next one we're going to talk about, and these aren't actually in order of the book as it comes to, as I come to realize, but acts of service and acts of service are actually my number one love language. And this is about doing something to benefit another without asking anything in return. So it could be something like cooking a meal, uh, cleaning something, repairing something, maybe offering to run an errand, pick something up at the store for somebody, or even something as simple as just opening a door for someone. Just showing you care by an actual act. And the core belief here is that love is about serving others. And I was trying to think like, why is this mine? Like, what is it about me or my upbringing that caused me to have this be my acts of service? And I think one of the things is also my mother's love language. <laughs> She's definitely acts of service because she, well, she had others as well, but I think this was at least one of her top ones. 
and I think it's also very common in a mother, you know, someone who's mothering to mm-hmm. give of themselves all the time. So having acts of service be that way that they show love, I think really makes a lot of sense. Another thing too, um, that actually a tip that uh, Dr. Chapman gives in the book is to, if you are an acts of service person, it's a good idea to ask the first person, sorry, to ask the person about it, if it's okay to do it before you do. So don't just, you know, go and do something for them necessarily, but maybe ask them, hey, would it be okay if I mowed your lawn for you? Because sometimes people might take offense to that. That is so incredibly important. My other Aquarius BFF is acts of service as well. And she's told me stories that sometimes when people do things for her, I wish you guys could see me doing air quotes right now. It is (laughs) not what she wants or needs at all. And it actually even makes her life even harder. It's so difficult. Well, speaking as an Aquarius, and I don't know if this is an Aquarius thing. I'm not sure that it is, but sometimes when people do things for you, it's like, well, now I got to go and redo it so that it's done right. You know, like, uh, I don't know, but that's funny that you point that out because uh, I think like every month or so you'll bring up something. Oh yeah. My other friend Aquarius who by the name, (laughs) by the word, by her name is also Jen. Like we have everything in common. Like, so it's, it's really weird. I wonder if we'll ever meet. You're like meeting a twin probably. (laughs) And and I do find even in my own practice, when I am am working with people, as you mentioned earlier, acts of service is often kind of tied into maybe that caregiver or nurturer archetype. So the acts of service people can tend to get really burnout, compassion fatigue, Mm -hmm. and even resentful if the people in their lives aren't helping them out. But on the flip side of that, Sometimes I've seen acts of service people get really controlling. Mm -hmm. And when someone does try to help them out, like cook dinner, they go in and take over because they're doing it all wrong. (laughs) And so I found that some acts of service people will block the receiving aspect of that Mm -hmm. in in a controlling manner. And it's interesting what you said also about compassion fatigue. I think that's really common with people who are acts of service. Again, you know, people that give so much of themselves without expecting something in return. So if you are an acts of service person, make sure that you have some sort of self-care routine so that you are taking time out during your week to put your feet up and do some an acts of service for yourself. It's kind of like what April just said about having words of affirmation for yourself. Make sure you're also serving yourself. Um, I do actually post about it on social media. I have self-care Sunday. I usually post little tips and things you can do just as little reminders. So kind of have a date with yourself to do something special like that at least once a week. That's so important. And the next one is receiving gifts. And I tell you, if you are a gift person, you know that you are a gift person. You do not have to sit and wonder, am I this or am I that? (laughs) And receiving gifts you love to be shown love and appreciation through a gift. And we're not talking diamond rings or anything. It could be, hey, I was at the store and I bought you some gum. Mm-hmm. And it's perfect because they want to, to be appreciated in that way. And gift giving, those who do have gift giver, gift giving as a love language, they give the best gifts. <laughs> and because they really take the time to know the person. So it's not just, um, oh, I think so-and-so would like this new shirt. No, they're going to look in your closet. They're going to look at your life. They're going to see what would enhance your life and make it better. And then they're going to spend great care and time to pick something that's really special. Mm -hmm. So they they are not just willy-nilly with the gift giving. They really, it is really thoughtful and special. Yeah. This is a person who at Christmas time doesn't even care what they're getting. They're more interested in Mm -hmm. seeing how everybody else enjoys the gift they're giving them. Yes. And it's usually beautifully wrapped and beautifully packaged. Mm. So when you've gotten a gift from someone who has gift giving as their love language, you want to save the wrapper. You want to save the ribbon because they've chosen every detail carefully and purposefully for your enjoyment. They do get that uplift from seeing you enjoy what they've brought into your life. And they also like to get gifts too. So, and you're going to know that if you're dating. 
or there too. <laughs> I think some people that have this sometimes are misinterpreted or misunderstood as being materialistic because you are talking about something physical that you're getting as a gift. It doesn't mean that you're greedy. It doesn't mean that you're materialistic at all. All it is, is a way of showing love for somebody because the way that they think about it, receiving that gift and giving the gift has nothing to do with materialism. So I think that's what's really important to point out. Absolutely. So the next one that we have on the list is quality time. This is the fourth one that we're talking about, quality time. It's about spending time with someone and actually staying connected to them. So that means no screens or distractions, giving them your full attention and being present with them, having conversations, meaningful conversations, listening to them, talking with undivided attention. Dr. Chapman especially noted to make eye contact with them. Don't engage in other activities. So for example, this drove me crazy. Quality time is like my secondary one. And my ex, when he was traveling or if I was traveling, you know, we'd check in on the phone and he'd lay down on the bed and talk to me and be like half asleep. And I'm like, hello, I'm here. Pay attention to me. Like we're trying to have a conversation or um, we'd be sitting on the couch and he'd be zoned out the TV when I'm trying to tell him something. And I think that happens in a lot of marriages actually. It does. But when it happens with a quality time person, when that's important to them and the other person's kind of checked out or not giving undivided attention, that can cause a lot of discord there. One thing that Dr. Chapman says is to listen to, uh, sorry, listen for feelings. So when you're connecting with somebody who is a quality time person, try to listen and see what types of feelings they have. Observe their body language. Don't interrupt them. Also make sure that you ask lots of questions as long as they're relevant and don't seem, you know, trite or like you just want to ask a question just to please them or something like that. But express empathy for them, understanding and then uh, Dr. Chapman also mentions that something you might want to do is ask if there's anything you can do to help. And this is kind of going along with what I said last time, you know, don't just say, hey, this is how to solve your problem. Say, is there something I can do to help you? Or if I did this, do you think this would help you? And, you know, don't be offended if they say no. Just the fact that you're offering to help them out in that way, I think, um, is something that would be appreciated. So also uh, following up on that, I've had some of my clients do, do you need me, do you just want to vent right now or do you need me to provide a solution? Yeah. So checking in with your quality time person just to make sure, do they need to dump and vent mm -hmm. and just get it out or do they want you to help the fix? Quality time is also my secondary love language. And I can honestly tell you that being interrupted is my biggest pet peeve. And secondary biggest pet peeve is if we're trying to have a conversation and you're on your phone. Yeah. So my ex-boyfriend did that constantly <laughs> and he's an ex. <laughs> Gone. But uh, yeah, it meant a lot to me if he turned off the phone and put it away where it's not even on the table. Then I was a happy camper and it didn't matter what we're doing. We could be Netflix or dinner, but I just wanted to know that he's not on the freaking phone all the time. Yeah. Because that he's concentrating on you and enjoying time with you. Yes. Yeah. So the next one is physical touch. And this is kind of a quirky one, but if you talk to men, usually one of their, it's either primary or secondary tends to be physical touch for them. I don't know if it's just the people that I end up talking to, or if that's a male characteristic in general. And I kind of had a theory. So for all you mamas out there that had little baby male children, did you rub their back to go to sleep or did they, they want to be, you know, extra hugged or rubbed. And I'm just wondering if that was a carryover, a good memory from childhood, hmm. if they got that sort of attention. Uh, my friend used to say women are waffles and men are spaghetti. So sometimes men just let things slip right off where women are deep. We hold stuff. We have pockets. So I think one of the easiest way, because in the society, men have been sort of conditioned that maybe it's not okay to show emotions outside of maybe a physical way. Mm -hmm. And I often wonder if that's another reason why men seem to have a really high statistical average of like physical touch is their number one. But physical touch can be anything from a hug, a handhold, a kiss, a cuddle, spooning, it doesn't actually have to mean anything sexual at all. And, you know, it's, it's really important. So sometimes your best huggers, those people that give you the best hug ever, they're physical mm -hmm. touch people. 
Yeah, actually, the fact that you bring up how there might be a tie to the man's mother makes perfect sense because Dr. Chapman did say at the beginning of the book how it's about our parents and, you know, how they showed love for us. So if you had positive experiences with that, that makes a lot of sense. Now, also in the book, Dr. Chapman in this section talks about inappropriate touching. And I don't know if that's just because this is a singles edition. I'm guessing it probably, he probably at least has some Thing about that in the regular edition as well, but there is some stuff about that. So it's really important to know the difference. So it can be kind of touchy for lack of a better sure. word. If someone has physical touch as their primary love language, because they might be someone who's more likely to cross a line or there might be some, they might be someone who you might be more likely to cross a line with. Um, I think with physical touch, it can be misinterpreted in so many ways. It's mm -hmm. kind of, kind of scary. Actually. In today's climate, it can Especially be a little bit risky, climate. right? Yeah, Absolutely. Sure. Mm -hmm. uh, one example of a married couple who did not have the same love language, her husband had physical touch as the primary. She was quality time and he desperately wanted to you know, touch her. And she's like, physical touch is my dead last. So mm -hmm. what they compromised on is when they were falling asleep at night, she would hold his pinky until he fell asleep. And that was good enough for him. He just needed some kind of touch, whether it's like, put your cold feet on top of like his feet, something. Mm -hmm. But that little touch was important to him. So even though it was her dead last love language, she couldn't stand it. She made the effort for him because she knew it was really important to him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that shows a lot that she's willing to put in that effort to do something for someone she loves that isn't her norm, which, you know, obviously, you know, that you have, there's a lot of give and take in relationships, but I think the first step is just understanding your own and understanding your partner's so we've gone through each of the five love languages, but if you still don't know what your love language is, or you're not sure at the end of the book, there is actually a quiz you can take that helps you figure it out, or at least confirm what you might believe. I think he actually has it on his website. So um, you might want to head over there and take a look. Yeah, that's the five love languages. So pretty interesting stuff. Again, this, um, you know, since reading this book, it really helped me to understand a lot of my close relationships, especially the relationships with my kids, mm -hmm. because once I knew what their love languages were, I understood that they were, because I was going through a time where I felt like, you know, my kids had some resentment toward me because of the divorce. I don't like to get that personal, but this is a really actually a good example. And um, once I understood what their love language is, I realized that they were showing love for me. It just wasn't the way that I was expecting. So right. a lot of it has to do with expectations, but now that I understand that and know a lot more, it makes me realize that. And actually, I think this is how you introduced me to this book because I hadn't really heard of it before. And uh, mm -hmm. we were talking about that and you told me, what's your love language? So I'm like, what? Mm -hmm. And so we started talking about this and I read the book and it really, really helped. So thank you, Dr. April for yeah, all that. You're because welcome. It was definitely life-changing. One of the few, one of the couple life-changing books that uh, I have. And we talked about one of mine last time too, with <laughs> forgiveness. But anyway, so um, yeah, so yeah. I do, we do recommend you do take a look at the book. If you're not sure, like, like I said, you don't necessarily have to get one of the specialized versions, but you can find it on Amazon. We'll put a link to it in the description for the podcast. Yeah. I believe they also have an audiobook version, you know, like everything does nowadays. And it is so important to, to understand because our own personal number one and number two love languages will become our default. So mm -hmm. then we will sh try to show love in those ways because that's often how we prefer to receive love. And if your partner is a mismatch, then they're not going to feel loved. Uh, for example, I once dated a guy who had a number one acts of service. And sometimes, jokingly, I have said acts of service is the suckiest love language <laughs> <laughs> because it is hard. It's hard. I feel it's for you hard guys. For you. It. It's hard. So yeah. I'm a words of affirmation. He was yeah. acts of service. So he made me dinner one night. He's showing me love in his act of service way. Yeah. And I said, thank you, honey. This love is, this dinner is amazing. Oh my gosh. I really appreciate it. Uh, this is the best spaghetti I've ever had. So I'm trying to show him love in my way, which is words of affirmation. Oh, mm -hmm. right. But 
you could tell he was just disgruntled. Like, I don't know what he expected. Like, I don't know what I was supposed to he do. He probably next. expected like, you to do go the clean dishes. The kitchen. Yeah. yeah. And, but I will tell you acts of service is probably my dead last. Mm -hmm. So I don't think in terms of acts of service. So for me, that is really hard. That's a hard mismatch for me because mm -hmm. it's my dead last. So here I am wondering why the heck he's so disgruntled and he's wondering probably why doesn't she appreciate me? <laughs> and, and that's just a minor example of how mismatches. Now I'm curious okay. here, did he give you your words of affirmation that you were looking for or no? The last ex, no. So mm. I ha I even told him and I even asked him because you guys know as the top of the show, I love personalities. I want to know what your sign yeah. is, like yes. where this stuff is all at in your chart. What, are you an introvert, extrovert, all of the things so that I can connect with you better. Mm -hmm. And so we quickly sorted out, he's physical touch, I'm words of affirmation. So I made special effort, let's hold hands you know, he put his hand on my knee when we we're watching TV or whatever, but he would not give me the words I needed. And I mm -hmm. kept asking, give me the words, give me the words. And then when he did do it, it felt kind of trite. Like you mentioned, it didn't mm -hmm. feel authentic. It didn't because, feel genuine. No, yeah. because he knew I was looking for it. I must've given him a look like, <laughs> mm -hmm. aren't you going to tell me that dinner was awesome? <laughs> I think too, like, and I'm not saying this is the case, but I think sometimes people can be manipulative and like sure. hold back because they want to be controlling or they want for whatever reason, you know, they resent something. So like, well, exactly. I'm not doing that then, you know? So I think that that can be used kind of as a weapon too, but like anything, you know, really in yeah. a relationship. Right. So if you are not getting what you need from your partner, it's really important that you even educate your partner that love languages are a thing. Like tell them you guys both read the book yeah. as like an assignment together. The original book did have exercises for couples and to just foster their awareness and how important it was to show love the way they want to receive it. And it may not be natural the way you prefer to give it. Mm -hmm. So it does take some give and take effort from both partners on that. Good job. Really Ooh. interesting stuff. I love it. I can talk personality stuff <laughs> all the time. Yeah. Super geeky. <laughs> so that is our overview about the five love languages. Again, you can get it on Amazon. I will include a link, but um, I think now it's time to move on to our mailbag section. I think April, didn't mailbag. you say that you had a question from somebody that you wanted to talk about? Yes. So this is for Tom in Arkansas and thanks for listening, Tom. And hey, we, Tom. Re we really love our guy listeners. So I know, I know awesome. we're, we're two awesome magical chicks here, but well, we, we love all our listeners, but <laughs> we know that most of you are women out there, but it's nice to hear from a guy once in a while. Yeah. So thanks for representing Tom from Arkansas. So Tom writes, I, April and Jen, hi, I really love the show. And I have a question that I can, that I'm hoping you can help me out. So my question is, I often have a hard time connecting with people and I don't know why. What would you suggest that I do? Signed, Tom in Arkansas. Tom, this is such a great question. Yeah, it kind of goes along with what we were talking about tonight, actually. That's right, Tom. There are a lot of reasons why you may not connect, but there's an exercise I do like to use with some of my clients, and it's called the negative consequences exercise. So sometimes when we're faced with something that we feel we're not good at or that we can't do, or it feels a little scary, it's our brain, our subconscious and our unconscious mind trying to tell us that there's some sort of negative consequence that would happen if you got your desire or if you did the thing. So when it comes to connecting with others, I would challenge you to kind of think back or think, dig in and think about why you feel you don't connect well. And then imagine if you did connect well, what would be the negative outcome that might be acting like a subconscious sabotage? You mean like what's the worst that could happen kind of deal? Exactly. What's the worst part about it for you or what's the worst thing that could happen? So for an example, in connection, if connecting with something, someone is his desire, the negative consequences would be, I wouldn't have anything to say to someone. I'm too shy and they would just turn their back on me. 
or maybe I would look foolish or I might get something wrong. Yeah, that makes sense. Or people are talking about something that I have no idea what the topic is, so I can't contribute. So if you boil those things down, it really is a fear about rejection or even abandonment. So that might be the Mm -hmm. worst case scenario or consequence. So how do you overcome that then? So a great way to overcome that is to, to just get out and try. And one thing is when you identify the negative consequences, because those are subconscious fears, those are not necessarily reality. So when it comes to connecting, if if it's a fear of connecting that's actually stopping you from connecting, then almost by overcoming that is to make a conscious effort to connect. And some ways that you can connect is to try to find a hobby or an interest. And there might be a community group that has that hobby or interest. Because when you're looking at it that way, everybody in the group has one thing in common that you're interested. Like, Jen, you play ukulele. I do. Right. So it might be a ukulele group. Mm -hmm. And I have been a member of a ukulele group. Yes. Fantastic. So that lets you know right off the bat, everything has, everybody has at least one thing in common. You are not different from anyone else in the room in terms of that one thing. Interesting. So that helps foster a sense of security and safety that you all are alike or similar and that you love ukulele. Mm -hmm. And then it's try to ask questions to try to find other similarities because the brain, that survival brain loves to fit in and feel safe. So when you ask questions and truly listen for an answer, you're able to kind of find other areas of commonality because we're more alike than we are different. For sure. But it's our worst case fear that we're too different to fit in. And if you can overcome that fear by soothing that fight or flight piece of your brain that, no, okay, we we like ukulele. We're both women. We both like ukulele. There's two things in common right there. Mm -hmm. We both lived in Arizona. There's three things in common right there. Mm -hmm. So meeting new people is a lot like going on a date. For sure. you, You might have a list of questions that you want to know the answer to that might help. Like, what's your favorite color? What's your favorite food? Mm-hmm. You, we might find out we both freaking love potatoes and it might, and you can go from there. Like, what's your favorite? I, for me with potatoes, I'm like Forrest, like Forrest Gump, Bubba Gump. I can eat mashed <laughs> potatoes, fried potatoes, baked potatoes. So the fact that you're talking about asking questions also is really good. I think um, some advice I would give to Tom is think about some generic questions you can ask anybody in the world. Mm -hmm. So like if you're at a cocktail party and you don't really know anybody, but um, let's say it's here, like we're in Texas right now, you know, you just say, hey, how long have you been in Texas? Or, you know, are you native? Or, um, you know, even just something like, what do you do for a living? Just something generic that can start a conversation and have those kind of in your pocket so that you can always have something to ask somebody that's relevant. And then, you know, if someone asks like, you know, how long have you been in Texas? Well, I've lived in Texas for two years. Oh, where were you before that? I was in Arizona. Oh, wow. That's great. I've been to Arizona. Mm -hmm. I love it there. They have really good golfing there, you know, and then that person be like, oh yeah, I used to golf every week, you know? So before you know it, those commonalities keep piling up and piling up and Mm -hmm. piling up and it doesn't, it's not so scary anymore. Another point I want to make too, is to keep in mind don't put so much pressure on yourself because I think personally that one of the things that's so beautiful about getting to know new people is getting to learn new things and learn about them and learning about how we're different as Mm -hmm. well, because you have certain things that you bring to the table that are different from everybody else that you can teach people or share with people and help them with their knowledge as well. Mm -hmm. Um, Maybe it'll spark some ideas of theirs and likewise you can get the same from them. Exactly. And connecting is a skill, much like public speaking. So if you didn't feel you were great at public speaking, they have groups like Toastmasters to learn tips and tricks to do that. And there are lots of resources out there to help you connect and and improve that skill set as well. And going on that question, one of my interesting things I like to know if people say they're from Texas is what's your favorite thing about Texas? Yeah, that's great. Yeah, right. For sure. mm-hmm. It's like if you no find ma- something, no matter they how love, long they've been there, they're going to have right? something favorite. 
I mean, something might be Bucky's. <laughs> That's exactly what I was going to say. But you Bucky's. saw my post from earlier. That's why. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, my favorite thing about Texas is the weather. And that freaks people out. And they're like, what? But I need variation in my weather. Oh, we've got that for sure. Yes. Yeah. But when you ask these uh, unique, quirky questions too, you know, that's memorable and you make yourself memorable that way. There's one other thing too, a really good tip. One of the best tips I ever got, if you're ever somewhere and you don't know anybody and you're like, oh crap, what am I going to do? Who am I going to talk to? Go stand by the bar because that's where oh everybody's going to be. Best tip ever. I know, right? And you know, have, just have a drink in your hand and people, you know, just, you don't. I mean, you're not going to be like hovering over them, but just be near the bar because people, that's where they congregate naturally. Yes. So uh, that's always a really good uh <laughs> That's good tip I learned from a former boss. So Oh, it's brilliant. That is like the introvert tip of gold right there. And <laughs> I'm guilty of being a bar wallflower, a bar flower, if you mm. will, <laughs> myself, because I like one on one interaction better. And sometimes groups can be kind of scary for me. But if people are coming up to the bar, that's my opportunity to have some one on one time. Yeah. Just what you are know, you drinking? What are you, you drinking? You know, that's a perfect question to keep in your pocket, yeah. Tom. So I'm excited for you, Tom. You can do it. I believe that you can do it. And if you write down what your fears are about it, then you're going to see that maybe those things won't happen because those things aren't logical. Fear isn't logical. True. And it is, it can be overcome. You just have to believe it. And uh, also, if you truly do have fears, there are two really good ways to overcome fears. <laughs> one is by doing yes. net and the other one is by doing hypnotherapy in yes. April. And I have you covered on that. Not that I wanted yes. to turn this into a plug, but um, and if you those... didn't know what net was, it's neuroemotional technique. Mm -hmm. And that's my specialty. I'm your girl. For yeah. That. And then, you know, myself, I do hypnotherapy um, where we, it's actually very, very good for long-term results too. So if you're interested in any of those things, just go to the, our website, spiritualbasicspodcast.com. And we've got links to our websites in the about us on the about us page. So. So thank you so much, guys. If you have any questions, please do send them to us at spiritualbasicspodcast at gmail.com. You can also visit our website for a contact form. Again, at spiritualbasicspodcast.com. We would love to hear if you have any suggestions for shows, any questions, or just say, hey, we'd love to hear from you. Thank you so much for listening. We just love you guys. Yes. Thank you so much for joining us. And we will see you next time. Bye.